topic was the entropy of a tiger and non equilibrium entropy. So, thank you very much, Christian, and this is for the delay. No problem. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me for this, uh, on this series of uh, colloquia. Indeed, the, the title of this talk um, is a question. Um, so maybe you expect an answer, but we'll see what will come out of it. I would say that the question to ask a question in the title is a bit of a provocation, and at the same time, it's a bit of a challenge. So I think I would like to first put it in the context of a big challenge. You know, there was a time when we were learning physics that it was called to be about dead matter. It had to be, you know, about things which do not um, have any life in them. Nowadays, that has changed, and somehow I would like to connect it with this ambition that once was very much alive in Granada when Christopher Columbus got uh, the, the agreement of the Catholic monarchs to sail for the for the Indies or for America to go beyond the Gibraltar uh, pillars, and that's a bit what we would like to do. You know, the man's reach should extend his reach. Or for what is heaven? No? So that's why I dare to ask, what is the entropy of a tiger? It happens that in other branches of physics, people ask, what is the entropy of a black hole? Not so much to know what is the number, but somehow it opens your eyes and it opens challenges, it opens new perspectives to understand perhaps what is the issues to be uh, done. More specifically, the purpose here is that I would like to understand how to ask about thermal properties thermal properties of non-equilibrium systems. And what we will learn is that, in fact, one of the things I would like to stress is that it's thermal properties in contrast with equilibrium are not purely put in the context of an entropy question. It's not just entropy in the thermodynamic sense that will matter, but it's also kinetic aspects. So that will be one of the, 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 let's say the messages of this, of this talk. Okay, so what about tigers? Well, first of all, a tiger is a non-equilibrium system. That's the most important thing that I will use about the tiger. Um, but of course, in what sense is it a non-equilibrium system? Well, for people who have been remembering, maybe if you're very much a student, you, you know it very well, that you, we learn in, in thermodynamics about the Carnot engine, you know, how to uh, get work done in thermal ways. And typically, this typical program of such a heat engine is that we have a hot reservoir to the left here, and we have a cold reservoir, and then the machine is doing work. That's the kind of the scheme that we recognize from first courses in thermal analysis. Now, somehow take it not very literally, our scheme, but think about our machine as being the tiger, which would be a non equilibrium system. And then there is some resources, which could be food and other, other material that the tiger is using in this metabolic system. And then there is a lot of waste. And there is things which are dissipated, which are destroyed, which are somehow degraded, the energy which has been coming in. And at the same time, the tiger is doing something with the source. So it's this big machine, this non-equilibrium system that we take as being somehow represented here as the tiger. Okay? So more abstractly, you could say that a non-equilibrium system is, in words, no? we will be concerned with what is called steady non-equilibrium. And that means that currents are maintained, currents of particles or of energy are maintained during a certain scale of time. You know, everything in physics depends on the scales of energy, length, time, etc. Non-equilibrium is also, in a way, steady by by the grace of that reservoirs that frustrate the system remain there. You know, think about an, a, a, let, a, a metal bar which is connected on the hot reservoir and a cold reservoir. What you do is you think of these hot and these cold reservoirs as being stationary, constant at a certain high and low temperature, and you want to study heat conduction, right? That's a particular setup that requires an approximation, as is often done in physics, and that's what we are interested in. So we're interested in steady non-equilibrium. So non-equilibrium means stationary, steady condition where currents are maintained, and there is a net entropy production, there's a net degradation of energy, waste is being produced towards the environment. That is the kind of simple way of, of depicting here what we mean by the stationary tiger, the stationary non-equilibrium system. 
Okay, now, of course, the tiger is much more than a non-equilibrium system. What I want to stress here that there are so many, such a wealth of non-equilibrium systems from cosmological scales to nanoscales, life, normal life. Uh, so, so you really say non-equilibrium is overdone. I mean, it cannot be that we give a statement of all possible non-equilibrium systems. So it's just a type of non-equilibrium system. And so what I will be doing, I will, of course, also be very, very restrictive in the particular model and setup that I will be taking. Okay, let us, however, start with something which is much more boring, and that's called equilibrium. Now, equilibrium, statistical mechanics, equilibrium thermodynamics, the questions that you are asked there is, what are the phases of matter? Is it, I mean, is it, suppose you have water, is it in the ice, in the solid state, or is it vapor, is it liquid, or what is it? Or if you uh, should I, oh, yeah, so yeah, I should yeah. like, move some okay. So some, sometimes you can ask, is it, you know, do I have here in the, in the state of matter of graphite, do I have a diamond or do I just have a top of a pencil? These are the things you're asking and you want to decide. Now, the point of what equilibrium is, it's, it's a miraculous thing, is that basically to many, many of the questions in equilibrium thermodynamics and equilibrium statistical mechanics can be answered by balances. I mean, the balance is most of in equilibrium, as you would say for equilibrium, most of the time it's out of equilibrium, the balance, and it's exactly the balance between what is called energy and entropy or free energy balances. That's always the game that you're playing in thermodynamics. And that decides, for example, why water will uh, boil at atmospheric pressure at 100 degrees Celsius. These are the things that are related to that. So let me However, stress now the word entropy for this equilibrium statistical mechanical considerations. Indeed, it's all about an essentially unique entropy. And, you know, um, depending on uh, what kind of courses you have followed or, or you remember, you find that entropy somehow miraculously appears under, under various ways. So the origin is, of course, with closures around 1865, where there is the closures heat theorem. The exact differential, which was related to the reversible heat of a temperature. So it was related to heat. That was the origin of, of Lausius entropy. But soon, by the genius of people like Boltzmann, it was understood that this Clausius entropy related to heat deeply connects with fluctuations, with combinatorics, the so called configurational or Boltzmann entropy. But that was not the end. Boltzmann also derived an H theorem for a dilute gas showing that indeed, as in Clausius heat theorem, there is an arrow of time associated. So there's an H functional, which is representing that entropy for a dilute gas, which is monotone in time. Yet that was not enough. There is also something like a fluctuation dissipation theorem. And the word dissipation is not for nothing there. It really refers again to entropy. It says that the response around equilibrium in the linear regime, the so-called linear response regime, is governed by entropic considerations. And finally, and I could, I mean, the slide is finished, but I could even go on. There is also the Onsager ideas of entropy giving rise to forces. It really is a force. It represents something like a thermodynamic or even entropic force um, that you would think Miraculously, why would it be related to response or to heat or to fluctuations? And in equilibrium, it's always basically the same entropy that happens and has a physical meaning. I'm not even speaking here, and I do not want to speak about entropy interpretations related to information or complexity. I think these are a little bit too trivial. But here, I'm really specifying the, the, the important things which are related to the physics of it. So just an idea for a t-shirt here that you can summarize all of these um, phases of entropy um, in formulas, where S would be the entropy. So for example, a force in thermodynamics can be seen as, a, as derived from a potential, and a potential is a thermodynamic free energy or an entropy, and so on and so on. So if you would like to have a t-shirt which does not only show Maxwell's equations or maybe even Lagrangian of the standard model, you can try to promote t-shirts where you have the miracle of equilibrium statistical mechanics on one side and on the other side, maybe we'll have some non-equilibrium and we'll speak about the entropy of the time. All right. Now, 
I let me just quickly, I mean, I don't want to spend too much time with equilibrium, but just very, rather quickly remind you of more specific aspects of this entropy of equilibrium systems. But one of the things that is used in since ages, so to speak, in chemistry, in biology, of course, also in physics, is the ideas of what is called irreversible thermodynamics. And very often, you're using their landscaping, which means that you think about a free energy landscape, it could be an entropy landscape, it could be an effective free energy landscape, and it's like a toboggan, and your system is like a little car which runs on that landscape, and you would like to see how does it go, where is it, suppose it starts somewhere, where did it fall? All of neural networks, all of machine learning is in this picture. It is related to cost functions and it is related to finding local minima and to get it moving. These ideas of which are old as, uh, well, as, as statistical mechanics and equilibrium is old, are very much popular and modern and very useful and powerful today still. But another thing which is miraculous, and I'm repeating myself here, is this Boltzmann formula that the entropy is like the logarithm of the probability. What does that mean? Well, let me just show you again the power of, of this idea, because it gives rise to what we know as the variational principles. You know, like the Gibbs variational principle to characterize whether we will see liquid water or ice. Where does that come from? It comes from that, namely, that by the miracle of Boltzmann, if you ask for the probability to see a particular particle density, a profile of matter density or mass density, even energy density, all kinds of, you know, you ask for a profile of something like a density, then a deep, maybe one of the deepest results of all physics is the fact that in equilibrium, that probability can be written as an exponential of a difference in free energies. So you have an equilibrium free energy, and you have something which is larger than that, which is, okay, the free energy functional, I'm not going to enter into the details here, but the point is that it is like an excess of free energy. So if you minimize that, it means that this is of order one. So in other words, to find what is the typical profile or the typical state of matter, you just have to minimize the free energies. So that's how the Gibbs variation principle enters, because probabilities, W, are given by exponentials of entropies or thermodynamic free energies. Right? So you see, it's a practical tool, it's a very deep tool, it goes from fundamentals of counting of probabilities all the way to irreversible thermodynamics and landscaping to understand biochemical reactions and so on. Okay, enough, um, basically, okay, there I will not, uh, speak about the Kubo formula, that is another example, as I told you, of the fluctuation dissipation theorem, but it's very important because, you know, for understanding response is basically what you do all the time when you study physics, right? You understand, you want to understand the reaction to stimulus, to change, and all of that. But again, their entropy ends. But let me skip that. We have to go to non-equilibrium, and I repeat, by non-equilibrium, think about simple things, such as, you have uh, here the representation of a system, maybe of particles, but what you see here is a vector field of forces. And the main thing that I wanted to depict there is that it is rotational. So it's not derivable from a potential. Okay. So it could be just um, if you are living on a, on a ring, typically, and there is an EMF that drives colloids around in a viscous fluid, you have already a non-equilibrium system. Here you have 40 says you have local rotational forces. Important, of course, if you want to start studying turbulence to have such a simple system to start with. But you can, this is like what we call a bound driven system. This is, would be like a boundary driven system where you have a different temperature at the ends of your metal bar. And here is your steady non equilibrium system. You want to understand the Fourier law. You want to understand the fluctuations of the energy of the density in this, in this metal bar. The same thing on the level of the cell, you have inside the cell, the outside the cell, you have ion channels. And you know, you want to understand if you eat a paprika, what is the difference that will happen? What is the, what is the difference in this ion channel that you will generate? And so on. Now, these are very traditional subjects in equilibrium. Let's say that the, the last two decades have seen an enormous explosion, especially experimentally, but also theoretically, where indeed the, the, the 
spillers of Gibraltar have been passed and where we enter with the full power of our steamboats, let's say, into the world of active driven systems, of living systems. I'm not speaking so much about tigers, but I'm speaking about E. coli bacteria, which are very well modeled, it seems, by active particles and entangled particles, but also the study of molecular motors, um, like you know, these enzymes, uh, kinesin, and so on, where people have been able to kind of study them and also make predictions and verify experimentally how they indeed escape the decay to equilibrium and how they are maintained by chemical fuels like ATP, etc. Et okay, so um, these are all models that have been um, in studied in the last 10, 20 years. And as I said, the experimental progress has been enormous in the sense that we nowadays, you know, using optical traps, um, the tweezers, femtosecond uh, camera, um, really data mining on the huge set of trajectories that one can sample, these techniques have a lot to get information which goes much beyond, like say, the thermodynamic information. Really enter into the kinetics and to trajectory-wise, you can learn more about these molecular view systems. Fine. So, welcome then, after all that, in molecular view statistical mechanics. If you are interested in things like uh, origin of biological functioning, what is life? If you're interested in the most, I mean, the, the greatest unsolved problem of classical physics like turbulence, welcome in non-equilibrium. But also if you want to know aspects like uh, cosmological issues, uh, entropies associated with geometric degrees of freedom, you have to understand aspects of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, but also apply things like if you're interested in climate science, sustainability, even models related to ecological science and sociology, many things use non-equilibrium statistical mechanics ideas, and you don't want to do everything, but you first want to understand simple things like what is the entropy of life. Okay? So, now let us start slowly with non-equilibrium. So far I have been telling you that in equilibrium statistical mechanics, entropy is like the unique concept, an enormous miraculous power to understand the states of matter. What about non-equilibrium? And now you also know what is non-equilibrium. Think about the metal bar with the hot and the cold reservoir, or think about migration of ions to a, to a channel because of difference in chemical potential, or think about the rotational forces so that you have a both back. Okay, so you first look, of course, to close to equilibrium. So close to equilibrium has a meaning, actually, which is non-trivial. It's not so, I mean, if you think about it close to equilibrium, you really have to think what it can mean. I will not explain it completely, but in words, I mean, with the examples, like if the temperatures left and right are very close together, or if the chemical potential difference is very small, or if the rotational part in the forces is very small, in some sense, you're close to equilibrium. Then we basically know what to do. We basically know what to do, but the point is that it is a bit similar to equilibrium. Um, if you're interested in these things, you can, I mean, between 2010 and 2015, we basically covered a lot of this close to equilibrium physics, and it goes from the so-called linear response ensemble, which are called McLaren ensembles, to minimum entropy production principles, to so-called closures heat theory, which also exists close to equilibrium. So all of these things we understand and we can do close to equilibrium, but there are no tigers close to equilibrium. In fact, Life doesn't seem to be very much compatible with the things that we are seeing here. I mean, I'm speaking about experimental evidence, for example, why these McLaren ensembles, usually in the response, is violated, why entropy production principles do not hold, why there does not exist an entropy in the sense of closures. I mean, this does not hold. So from second order around equilibrium, in a well-defined sense, life starts in the sense that we can no longer say that we are close to equilibrium. Okay, so that's where we want to go. We want to go all the way to ensembles which are tiger-like, which means that we have to go non-perturbative in our non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. And very soon, we see that entropy and its principles will no longer suffice. So it's like you have a valley of the river of entropy, and um, if you just look nearby, you just see that river, and everything seems to go to the same river. But if you go higher up in the mountains, from Sierra Nevada, you will see many creeks and little rivers, and they will be 
different. You can no longer say that the linear response around non-equilibrium is entropic in the same sense that this entropy will appear in fluctuations. This is no longer true. So this uniqueness of entropy breaks and it breaks from second order equilibrium. The miracle is that if you go close to equilibrium, all these different things like linear response, fluctuations and so on, they seem to converge into a unique entropy. But if you go away to second order, they diverge and new things enter. And the new things is what I often want to call, which are frenetic, which are frenzy, which are referring to dynamical activity, and we will see some of that. But the message, first of all, is that energy entropy considerations will no longer be sufficient. And we will have to think about things like, which were already mentioned, by the way, in 1975 by Rolf Landauer. The copy is not very good here, but um, there is a paper of Rolf Landauer. I hope you can see it a little bit about the inadequacy of entropy, inadequacy of entropy and entropy derivatives in understanding the steady state. And um, so he is basically saying, you know, I mean, it will be difficult. You can no longer use this irreversible term dynamics if you want to do real long equilibrium. And one thing he is saying in his uh, in the conclusion, he says he, he had a talk with Charlie Bennett, and he gives an example there. And the example that he mentioned is, I will read it together with you, is he says that to determine whether under a given set of planetary conditions life is the preferred state or only a middle stable state, we cannot just compare the lifeless state and the non biological state. This, what it means is that suppose I want to know what is the probability of a tiger or something like that. Dando says you have to have a bit of a different mindset. It's not like you should think only in terms of state functions. You cannot just compare death and life and see what is most probable. You can, of course, try to compare and, and be unhappy or happy about this. But the plausibility and the fluctuations and the response, the, the, the nature of that state which much depend on, which you cannot read here, must consider transitions between these states. So in other words, the dynamics, I mean, it's almost a triviality, but if you come from equilibrium, it is a bit strange. The transitions, the kinetics starts to matter much more than you have close and at equilibrium. So that is what we have to be prepared for if we pass this, uh, <coughs> this pillars of Gibraltar, is that we have to be prepared to really invoke aspects which are more kinetic and more dynamical. And then, of course, the question is, is there any structure in this big zoology of all these dynamical effects? Is there still a way to go forward? Because one thing is to say it's not equilibrium. Another thing is to say, what is it? OK, so just um, uh, um, a remark before I go to the main part of the talk is the following. You know, there is something like, I would say, an obsession with entropy. Um, that I have seen at least, in the sense that to that extent that people really think that one has to know non equilibrium entropy or something. If you know non equilibrium entropy, then you know everything. Then you know everything. Or, or also, people think sometimes, I mean, not only think, but also write it down and write books and papers and libraries about it. It is sometimes thought that um, life is really a dissipative structure, which means that um, the better you have an efficiency of dissipating. The more entropy production you have, the more efficient life is. Somehow people have been suggesting even, and Schrodinger was a bit similar to that, is that suggesting that the term dynamic hierarchy is also in the biological classification of species. Somehow if you go to a tiger with respect to an E. coli bacteria, that it must be, you know, much more dissipation must be there. That's not true. So there is, also here, you cannot have like that non-equilibrium is characterized by entropy production. Non-equilibrium is characterized by the fact that there is dissipation, but it's not true that if you have more dissipation and more non-equilibrium entropy production, that you have a kind of more efficient or more organized or even self-organized individual. That's just not true, but that's just a, just a remark. That again points to the fact that other things matter, which are again these things where Lando was speaking about, which are non entropic, non dissipative aspects of the language. Okay, so here we go. What about the entropy of a time? So, why would you care? 
Well, uh, first of all, you have to know what you mean by entropy of a target. So that's already a good way to care about in the sense that you would like to understand thermal properties, exchanges of heat and things like that, energy for non equilibrium systems. And if we say what is the entropy of a tiger, as I told you, in equilibrium that maybe is uniquely defined, but tigers are in non equilibrium, so we have to make choices. We are we can choose between speaking about the entropy, speaking about the response, but also speaking about heat. So here I, che I choose to speak about thermal properties, I, I choose to speak about heat. So the question then is can we have a physically well motivated and mathematically well defined heat capacity for classes, sufficiently rich and interesting classes of non equilibrium systems, steady, open, non equilibrium, active or driven systems? That's the question you're asking, right? So instead of asking such big questions like what's the entropy, you better specify to what do you know about the heat capacity of these systems. You know, that in equilibrium, after all, if you want to know in like you know, in many aspects of uh, physical chemistry, you want to know the entropy of a substance, you measure it, you get it via heat capacity. Right? And then you know it can be used to understand the general season energy, to understand fluctuations and all that. But here we just start from what's the heat capacity of such a non equilibrium system. Okay. So let me remind you if you are, uh, if this has been a long time ago, or maybe you have never been exposed too much to these uh, heat capacities. Heat capacities, they, um, they give a kind of inertia. Sometimes you can speak about a specific heat, and I'm not going to make much trouble in making distinction between molar, specific, uh, molar heat or heat capacity and all of that. But basically, what happens is that you want to know what is the the energy which is transferred, the heat which is transferred, if you change the temperature. Right? So you want, for example, to have um, uh, water. Uh, you have water, you want to raise it with a, temp with a one degree Celsius. You have to you put it on the fire, right? And if you do that with water, it is maybe different than if you put it with, with a brick or with sand, right? That's the heat capacity. The heat capacity for such an equilibrium system tells you how much energy do I have to transfer from my fire to the substance for it to decrease or sorry to increase one degree Celsius. Right? That is the heat capacity. It's an inertia against uh, heat to raise its temperature. It's like something like a thermal mass or a thermal inertia, you could say. Okay, so why did people uh, do such things. Well, first of all, it's for materials, it's very important to know what is the heat capacity. It also is related to aspects of conduction. For example, if you want to know heat conduction and other things, heat capacities will end. It. But there is a reason, a much deeper reason why people have been interested in heat capacities. And um, that goes back to um, the 19th century, where we had these old guys with beards. You know, that was the physics uh, in the 19th century, up to Last year, just to let that know it did go. But so the question was um, how, I mean, there was a problem with physics. And the, one of the main problems of physics, I mean, one of the myths and legends about the history of physics is that people thought in the 19th century that physics was uh, complete, that everything was free, and there were just a few clouds. That's often in popularized text. But in fact, many people were pointing out to exactly that question. Maxwell in the 1860s, genes. Holtzman, um, I do not recall all the names, they were referring to the greatest difficulty encountered by the atomistic theory, by the molecular theory. From the moment they started to think about what that matter is composed of, of, of corpuscular matter, they immediately hit a problem that they didn't get the heat capacities right. right. In other words, the point was that you had these laws like you know Petit and other kind of equipartition laws to find the heat capacity, and they failed at low temperature most of the time. So there was a problem, and when when Einstein in 1911 came to the first um, Solvay conference in Brussels, the subject of his talk was heat capacity. I mean, what happens to heat capacities in the new quantum theory? That was basic. So heat capacities. Um, Gibbs in his book, Statistical Mechanics, was in 1902, I forget what was the date. In his preface, he said, look, there will be a book here about equilibrium statistical mechanics, but be careful. It must be completely wrong. 
this is not what he's saying, but that's what you can read more or less in the introduction. He said the reason why it's completely wrong is that it gives wrong predictions for the capacity. So it gives us also the lesson that you can still write books even though it's wrong. I mean, it could be wrong. I mean, from the, the greatest minds, uh, even when they make mistakes, you can learn a lot. Anyway, so why am I saying that? Well, to tell you that these heat capacities are not just a material property, like you have so many, like the color of my skin or something like that. It really has something to do with the generacies of energies and how the structure of matter changes at low term. You know, what you can discover about the system uh, when, you're, when you're there. Okay. Now, um, my battery is on auto. Yeah, there is another question which is very intriguing, and I wonder what your answer to that question would be. And is the following so, you know, let us not think about a tiger because we don't want to do this to a tiger, but just imagine some living creatures like my liver or something like that, or something which is supposed to have biological functioning or particles that are alive in it, something like that. Don't think about that. But now do the following. Just take it out of my body, put it on the table and, you know, put it in pieces and things like that, and put it in a calorimetric system and measure its heat capacity. Here is the question. Will it be different from my liver? Do you understand the question? So you could have the idea that life doesn't matter for heat capacity. That would be a natural idea, right? Especially for a physicist to think that, you know, you have these things which are organized, there's biological functioning, you know, my whole thing is here, uh, I am biologically functioning, but it doesn't matter for my heat capacity whether I'm alive or dead, because what else am I than molecules, water mostly, and you know, all sorts of things. And if I just take them all apart and I do the right computation, it will be the same heat capacity. So that's an interesting question, no? That's an interesting question also because at first we have, the, at least I had the impression that this would be the same heat capacity. How could, you know, how could life change the heat capacity? But the second thing is that it really points also to the question is a tiger a thermodynamic object, right? Or is there something else that matters? That's a bit of the same question. I was telling you that, in fact, tigers are not just thermodynamic, that this life starts in second order around equilibrium, and it comes with deviations from just dead matter in the equilibrium state. So in other words, what I'm telling you is that the answer is that is there more in life matter than term numbers? The answer is yes. And do energy work entropy differ between organized mixture of molecules and life matter? And the answer is yes. So that's, I mean, that should, that, that is shocking at a certain moment, I think. At least for me, it was shocking. And secondly, related to what I was saying with the man of the, with the beards there, it will teach us something about tigers. Okay? Good. Let's see if the battery is not reloading. So life would be different, no? This is okay. So here um, now I'm coming to a bit more, uh, a little, not very technical, but I'm going a little bit more in details now. And what I will do is the what I will what I, what I will do is uh, three things basically. First of all, I will just tell you what is the definition of heat capacity for non-equilibrium systems. It is the same as an equilibrium, basically, but you have to be a little bit careful what you're talking about. And then um, maybe I will not so much speak about the method to compute it, but I will just go through pictures and plots that have been produced recently, um, mostly in Leuven. And uh, I will discuss uh, and go through some strange things that they have, these plots. Okay. And then we'll come back to the non-thermodynamic features that are hidden in these heat capacities. All right, so here we go. So here is the, the main plot that we want to understand. So here is time for this classical system. And uh, before time zero, what you see here is a non-zero value of dissipated power. 
we have this open stationary system which is constantly dissipating like Joule heating or something like that so it produces entropy but let's call it dissipated power constant at time zero we change the parameter a little bit dx what parameter well you know uh, physics is full of uh, the things we want to change it could be temperature but it could also be another intensive parameter which I mean, you know, if I speak about temperature of this non-equilibrium system, you don't take it literally. It could be the temperature of one of the reservoirs to which the tag is connected. You know, it could be that I'm changing the temperature of the environment. It could also be that I change the temperature of the water in the tag. But don't be very specific for the moment. A parameter is being changed. Then after a long time, I go back to a new non-equilibrium state with a new parameter value. Again, some power is being dissipated. So if I integrate that over time, that's infinity. If I integrate that over time, that's infinity. But I can do infinity minus infinity, and I end up with this thing region here. That's what we call excess heat. This notion excess heat was already discovered or discussed, uh, at least in the 1970s, by, for example, my famous compatriot, uh, Ilya Prigozhin, already introduced these ideas of excess, uh, excess heat. But that's, that's what it is. Right, so in other words, before time there is some power dissipated, after a long time there is a new power dissipated, for example, less, and then that shaded region, that's what we call excess heat. Of course, if you're in equilibrium, then this thing is at zero, this thing is at zero, and you just get here a particular relaxation to a new equilibrium, and that produces entropy, that produces heat, and that's again the heat which is produced. So here it's called excess heat because it's in top on top of what is normally already produced as heat. So the non-equilibrium system, the tiger is producing all the time heat. But what we are doing is an old idea of thermodynamics. We look at the transformation between non-equilibrium conditions, just like all of thermodynamics is about transformations of equilibrium systems. Here we look at quasi-static, I'm not speaking about adiabatic, I'm speaking about quasi-static transformations between non-equilibrium conditions. So if you relax to a new non-equilibrium, you're constantly dissipating because you were and you will. But on top of that, because of the relaxation to the new non-equilibrium, there is on top of that also heat. And that's the one we are interested in. That's the excess heat. And that excess heat per dx or per temperature, if it is temperature you change, that we call the heat capacity. That is the non-equilibrium heat capacity. Okay? But of course you can do that um, for other parameters as well. So one thing that um, you immediately want to do now, once I have defined that, is to prove a third law of thermodynamics for non-equilibrium systems. What would it mean? It would mean that if you do this thing, so you have to set up with the things a bit clearly, but suppose I have my non-equilibrium system which is sitting, which has this rotation of forces, but which has a kind of a sufficient quantum structure to have like discrete energy levels. So it's more like a jump process. And you change the you change parameters, but you do this at very low temperatures. If you don't use targets for that, but you go very low in temperature, you go to non-equilibrium at very low temperature, then the excess heat should go to zero. That's the third law of non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Right? So that we cannot, in this generality, as I said, no, we cannot prove yet, but we are um, working on that, and we are um, having certainly a class of systems for which this is actually true, which is non-trivial, right? Because that says something. The fact that, you know, think about Neville's heat theorem, it really was important for the understanding of the structure of matter at low temperature. So also non-equilibrium systems, which have this kind of quantum features, which follow from a Fermi Dirac golden rule or something like that, they will have under certain conditions that heat. But we will come back to that. So that's the definition of excess heat. One thing I want to tell you immediately is that excess heat, that's not just for constant volume, the change of energy that you get in your stationary condition. That would be what you do when you take my liver and put it in pieces. That's what you do. There is another thing which is happening here. And that is related to what is called the pseudo-potential V. I'm not specifying too much what that is. But here, in that thing, will happen the kinetics. There's a thermodynamics, but kinetics will enter here. And it will change 
life from that matter capacity. That's what is going to happen. All right. Um, let's see. So uh, I have like five or ten minutes or something. Twenty. Oh, you will be. You will be sorry. <laughs> okay. So uh, this I. Yeah, so that is just repeating. I, I don't know whether it changed something. Maybe not been changed. All right. So um, one thing that I don't want to stress too much, but just to, to make clear how I relates to equilibrium. So this excess heat actually has an expression in terms of a, a correlation function, so a covariance. So these brackets here, that's in the stationary distribution. This uh, semicolon refers to the truncated correlation function. That's a covariance. And it's a covariance between what? Well, between something which you can call pseudo energy, which is the real energy plus a pseudo energy. And that is correlated with the change in the logarithm of the stationary distribution. So this is really a bad formula, but it also has some advantage. I will tell you very soon why it is bad and I don't like it, but nevertheless, if you're interested in equilibrium, it is good. Why is it interesting for equilibrium? Because, or to compare with equilibrium, because if you think about the Gibbs canonical ensemble, then this row is like exponential of minus beta, the energy, right? And there's a partition function and all that. So this is basically an energy. The V is not there because there is only thermodynamics, so you get an energy, energy variance. So in other words, you get if you do the heat capacity, you get this relation with the variance of the energy, which is a typical example of a fluctuation dissipation relation because heat capacity is a response to a change in temperature. And that's also why you will have, in, uh, in, when it all goes well, you will have a positive heat capacity and it is related to stability of matter and all of that. So if you want to see, what I'm saying here is that this formula, of course, immediately reproduces what you have in equilibrium, at least at constant volume. But for non-equilibrium, this formula is not very useful, at least not at first sight, because you can call this logarithm row as you wish. You can even call it an entropy. Not in my life, but you can even call it an entropy, the logarithm of row. But it doesn't help you, right, to call it, to give it a name. It's just there and you don't know it because you don't know the stationary distribution most of the time. Apart from equilibrium, there is not like a Gibbs formalism to produce you a form of the non-equilibrium steady state because it's no thermodynamic anyhow. It depends on kinetic details and all that. So that's not the way to go with this formula. Right? You can try to get information about it for specific models, for anecdotes, but usually this formula is not going to work. But still, you see something. And you see that also in non-equilibrium, the heat capacity has the form of a correlation function. Right? And it's related to some kind of a non-equilibrium response. We will come back to that very soon, but let me now go through a number of, uh, of uh, plots where the heat capacity has been uh, computed and uh, by people in Leuven like Rita, Paze, Simon, Irene, and, and Karl, Karl Netochny, who was also very much at the beginning of all that story of non-equilibrium coming with. So what you see here is just a figure, how to tell you the following. So this is um, for a so-called run and tumble gas. So you could more or less understand this as a suspension of E. coli bacteria at a certain environment, in viscous at certain temperature, but it's just a model, it's just a mathematical model as a kind of proof of principle, whether you can actually compute this heat capacity. And that is how it looks like. So that's the heat capacity as a function of temperature. Um, and I want to uh, show you, well, first of all, I want to tell you something which, is, uh, which I like. Uh, and that is that the orange line that you see here, that's actually an exact computation. So there is no approximation there. It's just the exact, and the, the dots are just simulations happening to follow each other. That's that the computer was working. But, but you can actually compute that for such a system like a dilute run and tumble particle system. And you will see, in fact, that also the heat capacity will go to zero here. Another thing you see is something which is not quite always what you see for equilibrium heat capacities, but seems to be related to, maybe some of you know these things, like anomalies in heat capacity, which goes under the name of Schottky anomaly which may be related to the fact, indeed, that you get some structure at low temperature to be seen there. 
But let us go and uh, let us not enter into full details here, but add some more pictures. So um, you can, of course, when you are in the mood of these pictures, you can try to understand, for example, this question. This is again for this kind of RTP, so this kind of mock proto models of biological particles. And the different curves that you see here, they are for different persistencies. So this alpha parameter giving different temp different um, colors, they refer to a parameter which refers to the kind of the, the efficiency of life, the persistence that you have. So if you are close to that, your alpha will be very big. So that's like the passive case. So this purple thing here is much more for the passive thing. Well, if you are very much alive and kicking, you are much more persistent and this alpha parameter, I mean, this is all in the model sense. Well, this is not in a very realistic sense, but if your alpha is very small, you have a greater persistence, there is less, less tumbling in your life, there is less erratic movement in your life, and you will see, you can use the heat capacity as a diagnostic tool to understand how far you are from equilibrium. So it really makes this deviation. Okay, now, so, um, of course, you can do many more things with that. Uh, this is for active particles, but of course, you can also do that for um, driven particles. And here you see something interesting happening also, uh, which is for a complete graph. So this is, uh, this is a, so what is the model that we have here? Um, think about a complete graph. So a complete graph just means that you have, um, like, I don't know, 10 vertices, and each vertex is connected to all other vertices, like the Erdosheni graph, it's called the complete graph. Okay, now what you do, you take one random walker, so you one random walker on this complete graph, a very simple system, but now the random walker has to have transition rates, right, to move to another vertex, so it has to jump. So how it is doing that? Well, you just take this graph and you randomly throw on each edge a bias, whether it is more preferable to go one way or the other way. So you have different epsilons, which are drivings, to go one way or the other way. So you randomly add loops to your complete graph where currents can happen. So this would be like a random, a random bioinformatic network. Uh, you just randomly throw the typical loop that you have in your cycles. You randomly add cycles in a complicated complete graph. And you look at the heat capacity for that system, like I defined it. There is also an energy landscape here. And that's what you get. So this is again an exact calculation that you can do. And now what is so this is what is interesting here, if you care. First of all, there is something happily at, at high temperature, which you can understand, but it's not maybe the most exciting thing. But what is exciting here is that look, at low temperature, there is some freezing that you get. No, it freezes out. It no longer seems to depend on what are all these colors. These colors are just different realizations of the random throwings of your biases. So if this is maybe for a complete graph of five vertices. And so all these colors are different realizations of the bias. But the interesting thing is that it seems to freeze to be freezing in structures that you can recognize as for at low temperature. That tell you something that if you know the heat capacity at low temperature, whether it is here or here or here or here, the different uh, structures in this in this bioinformatic network let's say another thing that you can easily see here is that you get negative heat capacity you know in equilibrium you can never get negative heat capacity sometimes it is said that for gravitational interaction you get negative heat capacity but maybe you better forget that but in non-equilibrium you have negative heat capacities and for good reasons and the good reasons I'm coming to that in a moment have to do again with the fact that it is life, non thermodynamic, it's driven. Sometimes it can happen that if you have a driven non equilibrium system, you know, you give it energy or you give it heat, you put it in the fire and it decreases its temperature. That is what happens sometimes, and I will tell you in a moment why this happens. Okay, so I'm not going to uh, go more on these plots here. Maybe just to tell you that experimentally, um, the way to measure these heat capacities, by the way, I hope that after this talk, all 
experimentalists in thermal physics will start to measure these heat capacities. But for the moment, there is a good method which is called differential calorimetry, where you are instead of doing this excess heat measurement, which is infinity minus infinity, mind you, you are just modulating the temperature uh, with a certain frequency. And if you look at the heat current, the out of phase component of the heat current, there is heat in the non equilibrium heat capacity. So that's another way which somehow doesn't pass via this infinity minus infinity construction to measure uh, heat capacity. But that's just a remark about how to measure it. Okay, let me end um, by going to that aspect about negative heat capacities. And for that, I will take you, uh, I'm going to, um, to the, the a new word, which I like, and which is supposed to be complementary to entropy and what we have been calling frenzy. So the heuristics is here that entropy is like a volume of a phase space region. Think about the usual Boltzmann picture where, you know, entropy measures like the logarithm of the phase space region for a given macroscopic constraints. Frenzy you should much more understand as surface effect. I mean, you know, if you have rooms which are connected, if you have a big room connected to a small room, it doesn't necessarily mean that you go from the small room in the big room because you need a door. Right? So in non-equilibrium systems, as I told you, kinetic effects matter much more. So in other words, jamming, trapping are much more relevant. So the surface of this, I'm speaking holistically, right? surface of these phase space regions start to matter much more. And that's the heuristics for understanding this complementary notion, which is frenetic to the entropy. And that is what is happening also in these heat capacities, as we believe. But let me show you on a trivial example what can happen. I mean, this is really a trivial example. Suppose I have a, a rough channel. And the roughness of the channel is that sometimes you have crosses, which are fixed obstacles in your channel. You have an external, this is not energy, this is like an external field by which you are driving these green particles. And this blue is just the, the temperature of, um, this is just the, the molecular water, the viscous substance, the sugar water. This is the blue. So you have these ping pong balls in water, and uh, there are obstacles, and you are driving these ping pong balls with a ball of pressure that you want. Now, here is a trivial remark. The trivial remark is that if you push hard enough, the current will go down. Right. Why is that? But the point is that you know you get this trapping. But once these ping pong balls here are trapped, and you increase this field, they even more trapped. Right? Because to escape, they have to go backward. But if the field is very high, they cannot do that. They are really stuck in their trap. And the higher you push, the less they go. In equilibrium, this is impossible. I mean the following, if E is small, so in linear order around equilibrium, the mobility or the conductivity is completely determined what is called the diffusion constant. And this diffusion constant, okay, it may be affected by all kinds of things, but it's positive. So in other words, if you look at the current voltage characteristic of solid state physics, Around equilibrium, it just starts with a positive slope, and this positive slope is basically a measure for the diffusivity. Same thing about thermal transport. The heat conductivity, it's an energy-energy covariance of the heat current. If you go further, and you go further than E, and you go to second order or beyond, you can have negative differential conductivity. The energy current will go down. And that's exactly what happens, of course, and you can easily convince you by some simple calculations that I will not bother you with. You will see that while you first have a positive slope in your energy current, that if you push hard, so this is the external driving, you may go down, you may even, it may even be that for finite values, but it depends a bit on the system, that you just die completely. You get kinetic jamming, completely trapped system. And, um, and this negative slope in, the, in, the, in this current is really due not to thermodynamics, but due to the kinetics. And that's this kinetic component which induces that trapping. Right? The same thing will happen for the heat capacity and this pseudo-potential, this pseudo-potential, whatever you, you want to phrase it, will pick up dynamical aspects in how the relaxation is happening. You know, relaxation, you know, classes. They don't relax very fast, right? They are like a metastable state. Well, 
And this idea is much broader than just for glasses. If you have between non-equilibrium systems, you can have trapping, and that will lead, especially at low temperature, to trapping. And you will have, for example, the issue of negative heat capacities, which will become possible. Okay. Um, I think I have said enough. I'm not going to make other examples, which I could do. But, um, of course, the point was not so much to give you a number for the entropy of a tiger. But the past was, was much more for opening the question what what could it mean to speak about entropy of living matter and whether it is exciting and um, for the moment obviously we are restricted to very basic models mathematical models or dilute gases of non-equilibrium systems and of course it is a, a prospect to extend that to a much more interesting system and to understand the truth about how interaction for example will also enter in these heat capacities Okay, so let me end by um, the tiger again, and let me end also by the title page of Fourier, who wrote, uh, it seems to be a quote in Greek, but here in Latin, uh, of Plato, at Pignum Regum Numeri, which um, he was putting in his theory of heat to show that, you know, by Fourier law, so to speak, also the heat has been reformulated in mathematics. There is a geometric formulation of thermal processes which have become possible thanks to the work of Fourier and all of the other people that put the conduction properties and the heat capacities in mathematical formulas. So what we are trying to do is exactly that, but for tigers, maybe also to put numbers to, related to thermal processes for active and non-equilibrium. So that's it. Thank you. Oh, we have now some time for few questions. Yes. Thank you, Chris. So, first, uh, a general comment that, I mean, there are some stuff that I'm talking about that are kind of connected to what we were talking about. So, in ecology, there are many universal laws that have to do with the habit. The most famous one is the tiger law, detected by formatas or even for bacteria for metabolism. Information on the fine, but it's something thermodynamic, and of course, scales as the mass of the organism to the three over four. And this law uh, is very fine and tells you the difference on the earthquakes of, for example, elephants and, uh, and tigers or mouse. Uh, it's interesting because this law has been demonstrated that somehow you can take uh, a transport network and you try to optimize it. The geometry of it to find is low, but nobody knows the thermodynamic meaning of that. And it's a thing that I at some point somebody should do it. And I think that we be connected to this somehow in a, in a large view. And also, there are many laws like that. There is also a law that we were relating, I think, actually, heat capacities in function of, I'm not sure heat capacity, but was related to, I mean, uh, the latitude of the animal mean and how they, they, how they dissipate. There are a lot of these stuff that are empirically clear demonstrated, but nobody knows that the modality of it. And there's another one that is the rate predator relationship, that if you take the, the biomass of an ecosystem, so there is a clear scaling law between the biomass of how many prey there are and how many predators there are. I mean, it's, it's something that, of course, must be related to energy. I mean, already Lotka was thinking about it, but nobody was able to demonstrate it. And I think that there are really interesting examples complicated maybe like dream examples of the goes in this direction. And a, a technical question, I wanted to know more about this pseudo-potential that you're using because I thought it was kind of a graphical potential like the law of the decision of FIFA to say no, so I didn't understand what you mean or yeah. you could hear Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I did not explain that fully right, this pseudo-potential. I only said basically that the zero in equilibrium. Um, so, but this pseudo potential is really measuring directly the excess work that you're doing. So, you see, you have a relaxation, and at every moment there is work which is being done. You integrate that over time, and you always subtract. So, you renormalize this work, this integrated work, you renormalize by always subtracting something so that it doesn't blow up. That gives you the pseudo potential. Uh, so, it's a direct measure of the relaxation of properties of. 
concerning work in the quasi static approximation. Okay, I didn't explain that. But let me just make one remark concerning your, your, um, your nice um, uh, expansion about various laws in ecology that I, I, I do not know much of what you're saying, and it sounds indeed very interesting. But as far as I have understood, and I have been looking at heat capacities in uh, kind of ecological papers and all that, it seems that more often than I wished, they seem to define heat capacity in a conservative way, which is the derivative of the energy with respect to temperature. They just use the definition from equilibrium, and they just say, well, no, it's not a stationary state, but okay, we just measure its average energy and we make, take its derivative with respect to temperature. That's the wrong definition. Yeah. That's even wrong in equilibrium with the volume is not fit, by the way. But in non equilibrium, that would not be the correct definition. So one has to revisit these things. But surely, I mean, your questions or your, your uh, remarks are very valuable, and especially uh, to understand that there's an evolutionary aspect. Yes. But certainly, one thing I do know, and which is a bit of contradiction in some of the remarks you said, is that it is not true that evolution goes in the direction of higher concentration. Maybe in some really easy case, like molecular replication, we will say yes, but then we will in more complex cases. Exceptions will be accepted. <laughs> but yes, but about the capacity in this example, that's the good you use the double I don't remember how they were going to buy it. Maybe we should be in stock. But it's another one that maybe I could send you literature. It's an interesting thing, like in the cotton system, you have the double it was at the mass over three over four. Okay. So less than one. But then in cities, in cities, you have that the row goes as a number of inhabitants at the power is 1.1. So the people say like cities create somehow, no, the, the, it, it's an English machine. No, it's English. Yeah, but it's interesting. I'll send you something. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I mean, I, I'm speaking as if this is all very new, but, you know, Lavoisier was one of the fathers of calorimetry, and you know, he was already thinking about, you know, life versus non-life to understand the capacities. I'm not sure exactly what he was doing, but um, it's, it remains a very exciting question. So, no mind. So, what well, um, <laughs> Is there this is any, the second floor. Any other, any other question? I think we are late to the issue. Yes, I'm sorry. Sure. Thank Christian again for a very nice talk. Okay, great. Thank you. 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 Thank you.